Hello everyone. Uh, today we are here for an every live program through Faith Bangladesh. And I am Manish Samnani and I, along with my wife Malvika, we both run a center for children with various developmental difficulties in Gurgaon, India. And we are very closely associated with uh, Faith Bangladesh uh, for joint programs, either for education or for service delivery or for any other events or initiatives that we could do together. Uh, in our vision and mission for bringing about connectivity with, uh, with people, with parents around the globe, we have come up with this program where we would like to invite different people from different walks of life, from, from people who are with different expertise and who can share with us what can we do actively, what we can do with a good mindset for helping our children. And when I say children, it's not just about children who have special needs. It's also about all children. Children at the moment are going through a very rough, rough phase, I would say, because of the ongoing pandemic situation. And there is a lot of talk in newspapers, in uh, literature, about how can we make sure that during this pandemic and during this lockdown period, this is during these limited activities for children that is possible, how can we make sure that their holistic health, their social emotional development is also taken care of, even much more in importantly than development in the academics and, and the physical development of course. Having said that, we have today with us a faculty from, from US, Jane, and Jane is a mental health counselor. She is someone who is a certified play and art board certified person. She's also a author and researcher, an academician associated closely with the Leslie University. And today we have with a, she, uh, welcome Jane to the show. And uh, as you are aware that the today's program is focusing on how play therapy and art therapy can help children. And we mean children of, children of not just having developmental difficulties, but all regular children or any child who would avail these kind of intervention or these kind of practices, I, I should say, how can, we, how can these develop their uh, or foster their holistic development? So uh, welcome, Jane. And I would, I would start by uh, uh, inviting you to share with us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your work that you do and what you do and how you do it. Oh, thank you, Manish. So um, the short answer is that I have always worked um, with children. I've been a preschool teacher before I was a therapist. I've worked in early intervention from zero to three for children who need extra developmental supports and for my goodness, over 25 years, um, I have been working as a therapist um, using art and using play. I think the way that I work is a little bit unusual because I very much integrate art and play. Um, my belief is that we don't always know what children will respond to. So we need to be very flexible to respond to them. And I think you'll, you'll see as you see this space um, that I have uh, a lot of choices. Sure. Having said that, Jane, we would definitely first like to see what a setting or uh, a, an environment that you might have there what kind of a setting do you use? Can you, can you uh, uh, get us a, a kind of a visualization of what is there around you so that we have some idea of what art and play therapy might be uh, doing with children? Okay. Um, I will give you a little tour. Please let me know if you can, if you can see well um, because I'm going to turn my screen. Okay. So Manish, you can direct. Yes. Um, yes, we can. Here, here is what we see when we come in the door of the room. The first thing that children see is puppets. 
and then let's go down here a self of instruments lots of choices things that we use um, for calming like the stir drum And then all of these figures that you see. Oh, wow, looks lovely. Jane, if you could be a little closer to the microphone, yeah. Okay. Is that good? Yes, that's good. Can you hear me? So I have yes. all these um, magical creatures and characters from movies and stories. And what um, we use them for is play in the sand. Um, this is my sand tray. And children can choose figures and they put them like this to tell a story and of course he needs a friend okay so there's there's his friend eeyore um and there's a reason why I have those particular characters right on my table with me, um, because one of them is very exuberant and excited. The other one looks a little sad. So I try to have things that help children express their feelings um, because they're coming to therapy often because it's difficult for them to communicate. It's not that they don't have ideas and feelings. They need more ways to share them. So I have all of these um, helpers, whether they look happy or sad or confused. And all of these things help children um, get started. I even have someone who, um, do you see the zipper? This is the, the yeah. worry eating monster. Um, if you have a worry, you can write it, or if you can't write, I will write it, and we zip it in his mouth, and then we see if it goes away. And interestingly, um, art and play are really effective in addressing worries, fears, um, and the worries do tend to go away. Um, if children are feeling really uncomfortable, um, there are other sorts of things they can do. This is my, oops, my sphere ball. It's enormous. I can go in it. A child can go in it. Um, and sometimes they choose to go in there maybe with a, sorry, stuffed animal um, or an instrument to just sit inside as a, safe place. So that's a very, very quick tour. I asked a little girl yesterday what I should show to everyone. And she said, you have to show the toys and you have to show painting. So I did grab a couple of um, pictures to show, to give as examples later. Um, there are many more things here, but that's an overview. And of course, it's important you know, when people are playing with, with children to support expression, you don't need all these things at the same time. You could choose three things and sit on the floor with a child and let them pick one and then move um, from there. Sure. I mean, it looks absolutely inviting and exciting to see the kind of stuff that you have there, uh, Jane. I'm sure every every child would love to come there again and again and would actually you might have you might have a difficult time sending them out of this place uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> children do yeah. not want to leave um, and I, I think one of the reasons why 
is that I'm very aware of how the space is also supporting them. It really helps me in my work. Um, and we think in doing therapy with children that the first most important thing is they have to feel safe. They need to know that this is a place where somebody understands them. Um, so it's important to be able, I can't have everything, but it's important to respond to what they're interested in. And um, there's a reason why, oops, why this little guy is on my table, um, because so many kids like Pokemon and it's important to be able to say, oh yeah, I know about them. You know, let's, let's see how they're feeling. Um, so the children are really supported by the, by the images that they make and by the things that they play with. And I have lots of sensory things too. Sure, I'm, learned I'm, I'm, from, from OTs over the years. Sounds, sounds absolutely exciting. So, uh, uh, Jane, like you, like you said, that it is a, a way to uh, for the child to have some kind of a reflection, some kind of an expression of their emotion. I'm sure we all are in this, specifically in this phase of the pandemic, and also otherwise. Uh, a lot of studies have shown, especially in in, in in India, if I might share, that the schools have found out from regular children that the one particular parameter or quotient that they, that they kind of evaluated children on, they found very poor scores on the social emotional constructs of their development. And, the, and, and uh, aware schools are actually taking it very seriously. And they're very aware that this is something that cannot be, uh, that, that they cannot just let it be. They need to do something about it, maybe at the curriculum level, maybe at what, whatever level they, ca they can. But having, having, having said that, they are also, we are in a stage where we are socially distanced. And, uh, and whereas at the other, other side, we are saying that the social emotion was already at, at, a, at a low point. So if a parent or an educator wants to start with, so wants to begin using some kind of, an, uh, some kind of these, these uh, principles in, into their day-to-day -day life, beginners, who have no idea? Can you guide us? How how could they start with? What is what is their starting point to be able to do something in that in those lines that that you are uh, uh, that you have talked about? Ah, uh, so here is something incredibly simple that everyone can do. Doesn't matter if people feel um, they can draw or not. Okay, you might laugh a little bit. I did this together with a child. Um, but what we, oops, can you see now? Yes. Yes. These little people together. So yeah. this was made out of a scribble. Um, and then it turned into two people being together. Now, here are the two really important things about that. One is that I did this together with a child virtually in a video session. So I was sitting here at this table um, and the child was sitting with their parents' phone and we were both scribbling um, and then we stopped and we turned it into things. But when it was my turn, the child helped tell me what to make and it was very important that it was people together and they really kind of look like they're giving each other a hug don't they um so that was a way of beginning very simply but also of us feeling connected because the whole point of using art in therapy is to express perhaps what you can't say and to connect. It's lovely when children keep going. I have children that are starting to keep sketchbooks now and they show me what they make in between. Um, but the important thing that we do together is that we're connecting through the art. You know, we're looking, 
we're talking, sometimes we're not talking. I work with children who, who speak very, very little. Um, I work with some children who started um, telling very simple stories from playing in the sand tray that I showed you. Um, but the important thing is that we're doing um, something together. And Manish, you talked about the social difficulties people are having right now, um, you know, including a lot of fears. So I had a little boy who was having bad dreams, feeling fearful. Uh, we drew monsters together. Um, and he told me um, what to do and what to draw. And this is quite amazing. I wrote down what he said to me on the back of the drawing. Should I read it? Um, he, he kind of brought this monster down to size. And he said, well, you know, this monster eats. And then he feels better. And then he takes a break. Um, and then he goes off and does something interesting that makes him not so scary. Um, so we're, we're dealing with people's fears and we're also, this is kind of marvelous. I made this with a child's instruction. Um, she wanted me, can you see the glitter? She wanted me to yep. make a, a glittering tree. Um, and she was thinking of times that feel safe and happy. Um, and the story of this is and we did it as if it was a book. So the writing is on the bottom. This is the bird who liked Christmas in May. He liked all the presents and all the lights. And um, we chose things. She chose toys from her house and I chose things here. And she directed me that we could give as presents to one another. So we really had to use a lot of imagination um, to support and connect. I think those are the two most important things. Doesn't matter how what you're drawing um, looks, it matters that you are doing it because drawing is a very energetic process. It can sort of wake you up or it can calm you down. <coughs> yeah. And I only, I chose just a couple of drawings because I'm so interested in what would be helpful um, to our participants. Sure. Uh, Jane, we have a couple of questions coming in from the view viewers and we are, we are so happy that uh, uh, we are already receiving interest from parents and I can see that the questions are actually very, very relevant also. Uh, uh -huh. I, I would also like to inform the viewers that they can actually put up their questions in Bengali if they wish to. We, we would uh, definitely do something to make sure that the, that the Bengali then gets translated into a text and reaches Jane or through me uh, with the help of our, uh, uh, with some of our friends at, at Faith. We would get it definitely translated. So you are welcome to ask or write down in Bengali as well on the Faith Bangladesh page. So uh, one of the questions that has that has come, Jane, is that how can I teach my 5.9 years old boy to draw a circle? He has uh, very poor fine motor skills and he can draw a straight line uh, very well, uh, but very weak in circle shapes. This is a question from, uh, I'm, I'm sure, a parent, Samina Alam. Ah, that's such a great question. And here's why. As a therapist, an art therapist, I think the circle is important. Um, it's because it's like our face, right? And once you have the circle, um, you have a face, you have, this is a stress ball, <laughs> you have the sun. Um, here is something that I did with a little preschool boy. Um, and he was sitting at a table and he was very sad and i went over and i said oh what's the matter and he just looks like he was going to cry and he said i can't draw my mommy and he wanted and think about it the first thing he needed was a shape to draw his mommy and i said you know what i can help you do that um so what i did we didn't even start with drawing i got some scissors and I cut out some circles and I cut out some ovals 
and we, you know, we did this, we held them in front of our faces and we looked at our faces. And then um, he took one of the circles that I cut out and he made the eyes, dot, dot. That's the most important thing. You know, you, you start to see the face, like this face is super, super simple. Um, but it has a lot of meaning. All the kids kind of get it that this little guy is confused. So I think remembering what the child might want to communicate with that shape is really important. And I made like a whole stack of circles and ovals for this little boy and I came back and he had made so many faces. And then he switched over um, into drawing pictures. And he said, oh, it's mommy is sad and mommy has lipstick. Um, and then, of course, you know, there are some motor questions. And Manish, you would be the expert on that. But, um, you know, sometimes kids, this is my rainbow puzzle that comes apart. You know, sometimes they want a circle and they just pick a size. Every color is a different size and they trace them. And that's okay. And I have kids who don't feel comfortable drawing. I didn't show you my shelf with all the dinosaurs, but they want a dinosaur. And a couple of children have said, can I just go around the outline of this dinosaur? Um, and they do. And, and then it becomes not stereotyped at all because they completely make it their own, their own color their own expression. Maybe it's an angry dinosaur. Maybe it's a happy dinosaur. So as a therapist, I'm really interested in um, what is the story that the kids want to tell by making whatever um, they are making. And I have also on the table besides, um, besides these, whoops, cheerful or unhappy guys, you know, I have some little humans um, who look, um, very angry. Do you have these in Bangladesh? Have people seen this movie of Inside Out? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, so we have, you know, or maybe something similar. Anger. Um, and we don't copy things. You know, sometimes kids like to draw the things that are here, but all of these things, they're kind of like a visual vocabulary of, you know, what is it like to look sad? What is it like to look mad? What is it like to look happy? Or this is always, a good, this gets used all the time. What's it like to look confused? And he even beeps, <laughs> um, you know, and sometimes using the other senses too can really support in drawing. I know that's kind of a long answer, but I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, when you when you talked about uh, a little difficulties with fine motor skills, um, what I what I was thinking is maybe the child can also try some of the sensory motor kind of strategies. Like you know, we always say that a child can learn to use a tool like a pencil or a crayon only after he the child can actually use his own body, like a finger dipped in the color, and then making some circles using directly your body part rather than a tool, because uh, developmentally, your body awareness and your using your body sh should precede uh, your using of the tools. So sometimes what happens is that the children do skip and they go directly, chronologically, they, they, they might be suggested to use a tool. However, they have still haven't figured out how they could have actually done it with their body itself first. Or maybe they could, you know, there is a, there is a circle ma mark made on the floor and the person and the child is supposed to you know kind of just walk over those circles to have that kinesthetic idea in his brain about uh, a circle so uh, that combined with what uh, the the wonderful ideas that that you gave is that the circle should have a meaning to the child maybe a face maybe something so i'm sure uh, uh, if if both the things can can be combined together in an activity it would would be great another question uh, that is there in front of us is, is that the that the child is on uh, four years old and he has difficulty in, in speaking or talking he's receiving therapies however the child is just not interested in drawing mm -hmm. and it is it is very difficult to even make him 
take interest or make him just get engaged with drawing so this is uh, i'm sure another parent as well as fan who is asking how can i make him take interest in drawing uh so this answer is so connected to what you just said manish where children learn things first in their body of course if you've got a huge piece of paper they can just lie on the floor and go like this and they can have maybe a crayon in each hand and then they start to create this circle um so similarly if we're working on a little piece of of paper um there's lots and lots of ways to create some marks on this paper and they don't need to be say drawing with a marker i would say particularly not with a marker because that is an overly tight grip and you know they might not even have the grip to do that yet um one thing is um to have maybe a sticky paper a piece of sticky paper and you would have to supervise so everything doesn't get stuck on it um and some things that it's okay to stick on where a child can just pick up and go like that and it will stay there and even if they only put one thing look at this it's like a rainbow um so they start to make a connection between their action their physical action and their intention and that's really important that's where things start to be in expressive um that children realize oh there's a connection you know i like this oops i like this rainbow shape um i'm going to put it there they have an intention or maybe um something i have done with groups of children and it's really marvelous is i take pictures of them doing different things and we print them and we cut them out and they can put those on the paper so i mean you could even have a child um they might decide they're going to put themselves underneath the rainbow they don't have to draw anything to do that and they might not be ready to but they can express something and that's what's really important so i think it's very important for them to experience themselves as intentional and you know before kids draw anything they make marks very randomly and going big is very good you know big piece of paper so you don't need to be controlled i have a big um roll of paper and if i'm with um very little children or with families um they can sit around the table i take all my things off um even my lovely um mama bird <laughs> they all get moved and um i cover the entire table with paper and you you know you can lean on it and trace your hand which is a great thing to do with kids by the way because then they see it's an image of them you can trace their hands you can trace their feet um we we're really wanting them to connect that mark or that piece of paper or flower petal or whatever you have um to some idea that they had and using natural materials is a really great way to go in too like manish said you know connecting with their body using materials that are really appealing some people use materials that smell good um i have found that um the markers with a smell often get on children's noses so i don't use those um but that can be a very nice thing to experiment with too use all of the senses you saw i have lots of different instruments that have lots of different sounds and feelings we connect that with drawing too so lots of supports in in different ways and supporting stories sure and and uh, of course like like i said last line in the last question also if we kind of look at from the sensory perspective i would say beyond the body awareness for drawing also what is important is to have a lot of visual perceptual skills which are not just dependent on eyesight or they are not just dependent on having a good uh, uh, vision 
as such or a function of the eyes it's about visual perceptual where you kind of make sense with the with the shapes or the visual uh, visuals that you create in front of you or are created in front of you, you kind of take interest in the visual characteristics uh from that point of view i have seen children first taking before like we have pre writing skills before writing in terms of drawing we can have when children start playing with a uh, messy play you know if they are playing with colors and they are messing them around and if they are playing with some kind of uh, of of a uh, fluid or media like water even and when they start taking interest with the characteristics of it when they start pouring it from one to another they need they are visualizing what is happening as a visual characteristics of that object how do, how they are manipulating it visually how they are trying to make different shapes out of it i think that kind of also encourages them to take interest uh, towards something that they would create by virtue of mark making like you said by yes. virtue of pen penmanship like we say a penmanship should develop but before penmanship i think there's a lot of visual perceptual work that should that can happen as a part of usual child development uh, and the repertoire of play yes i'm going to grab um a little bit of clay because as you were speaking manish um oh this is a very fancy piece of clay i wanted something simpler but i can describe um sometimes sure. kids are much more comfortable you know with the tactile feeling of clay and they're really good at using that haptic perception um which children have and and this is actually a way that art therapists work with children who are not sighted is using their haptic perception to explore the world but i have kids this is this is very sophisticated. I wanted something simpler. This is my old office. Can everybody see there's a parking lot? There's lines to park the cars, all the details, all the windows. And my window has a little more light than the other one. Um, this was made by a child, an older child um, and very patient child who really didn't like to draw. Um, but they loved to use three dimensional things. So it's important to explore that too. I mean, three dimensional work with kids, it's pretty messy. I spend a lot of time cleaning up clay, but um, we are very rewarded by doing that. And I saw that there also was a question here about a child wanting to play on their own and to not interact. Yes. Um, one marvelous thing that happens when you have these little clay figures and you make one and the child makes one, um, and I use a very, very easy to manipulate um, kind of plasticine that doesn't take a lot of um, hand strength or skills, by the way, because it's very bendable. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show you an example. Hang on a minute. I know where they are. Okay, so this, oops, this is really simple. <laughs> All this child had to do was bend the stick of plasticine and stick on the googly eyes. And you've got a person. And when you've got a person, um, they can interact oops, with an another person. There they are. Hi. Um, so if the child makes something and I make something, and we're sitting together at this table, doesn't matter how simple it is, we can start to move them together. We don't even need to talk. Um, this particular child got really elaborate. Um, this, this entire box here um, is full of their creations. Um, this, this is a pond of sparkling water. Um, Oh, this is one of the best ones. This is the sun that is like a puppet that moves across the sky. Um, so when you start working in three dimensions, you have this possible interaction that's really, really 
um, fun. And if you model what you are doing on what the child is doing and you change it just enough so that they don't feel like you're being intrusive, um, they will almost always get engaged. Sure. Yes, that's a great idea. I, I think uh, what I also wanted to add to Afrina Nazli, Nazli's question that of, of the child really playing appropriately and talking appropriately, but on her own rather than somebody being a part of it, is that, uh, that, that her question is that, is that really necessary to really be, be a part of the whole thing if it is already so appropriate on her own? And um, I, I'm sure we, we, need to, we need to definitely do something so that the child relates to people or relates to uh, us, you know, as, as people much more or maybe equally to objects because uh, we, we want, we ultimately, we want them to be a part of a, a, a social group. We want them to be a part of a community, which would mean that they would need some kind of a using of the toys and objects or any, any tools, but we also want them to be a part of uh, being socially connected, which which does happen with other people. So I'm I'm sure we need to uh, we, we with Jane's ideas. You have some idea to how to, uh, in my words, how to uh, transform the relatedness to objects only, and join it, join people along with it. So the object relatedness then leads to people relatedness, and that's a, that's a great idea, I would say. Yes, and sometimes because it's therapy, we have to do it very gently. Um, and I've had children do that in my office in sessions with parents in particular, where the child is setting something up and the parent maybe will take a little car and try to put it in the middle of, of this play and the child will say no, or you know they'll go and they'll run away. Um, so we, we do this gently, but we do it persistently because um, while it's important to have those play skills um, and those inner resources and those ideas, it's also important to have um, relatedness. So sometimes what I do is I go back to very, very simple things. Um, and I have lots of baskets of natural materials here in the office. You know, I have baskets of stones that I got from the beach. I live near the, the coast. I'm very fortunate. Um, I have baskets of seashells. Um, I have baskets of marbles. I have a lot of kids I work with who love marbles. And I, I didn't show you, but I have some different marble runs. One of them makes music. Um, and one of them is like a competition, which they love. But sometimes we'll just take out a basket. They can choose one. And we sit together and we look at these things. It's so simple. But I have seen children sit for almost half an hour going through a basket of natural materials and picking the ones they like and looking at the ones that I like. Sometimes we really have to slow way down um, and simplify things um, to make that connection. And also really, really watch for those moments where the child is maybe inviting a connection. And we do also have to push them gently. I mean, Temple Grandin wrote a book called The Loving Push. It does feel like that. We're, we're supporting and holding, and we also are pushing, uh, and we're being very sensitive to the, the pacing. Um, so observing children yeah. is really, really important. Great. Uh, we have another, another question from Ifat Jaha Chaudhary. She is asking about her nine-year-old daughter who loves playing with a doll keeps keeps it quite cool close to the to her face to her eyes maybe smiles back to her gives an eye contact to her laugh to the doll um, however she still wants to facilitate something more 
than what she's already doing. I'm, I'm sure what she means is that having said that she's nine years and having said that there's a lot of involvement, although the, all the responses are pretty, uh, pretty uh, decent play behaviors. However, as, as, as a parent, of course, she, she wants to have a little more than what she's doing at the moment. Would you have any ideas on it? Well, um, I had a little girl that I worked with. She's older now, um, who did very similar things. And she actually came to my office with her doll and sat down. In, oh, she sat in the chair where I'm sitting right now at my drawing table. And she held the doll and she got um, some crayons. I have these special crayons shaped like pebbles. They were developed by an OT. They're really great and they're very soft. So she got a crayon and the doll got a crayon and she put the crayon, you know, as if it was in the doll's hand and she moved the doll. And I thought that was really brilliant because she'd never met me before. She'd never been here before. Um, this is, it's a very comfortable setting. This office actually is in my house. So it's not like, you know, you're going to a place with a great big waiting room with lots of people. The waiting area is very private. Um, but still, it was a little scary. So I thought it was a great way to explore something new. And then um, what she started to get interested in doing, this is not anything that I thought of, um, but she started making these little videos of her doll doing things um, and making up stories about it. She didn't always tell the full story, but but there was enough detail um, that her mother and I could understand what was happening in the story. And then we could give her feedback about what was happening. Oh, you know, your doll had a really interesting day today. Looks like she liked doing this. Um, so I, I realize as I'm talking, a thing I do all the time is I sort of sneak a story into things. It might be really simple, like there's this orange thing. It's like, oh, you know, it looks like a nice day. You know, it might be a nice day, might be something's gonna fall on your head. Um, but, you know, often I will start off with like the sort of most benign and, and more cheerful option. And if I'm wrong, the kid will tell me. Um, but we just, you know, maybe gently take a couple of steps beyond that. And I, I certainly um, didn't discourage her from, you know, bringing the doll or showing me what she did with the doll because the doll was kind of like an, um, an intermediary um, who just, just like these, um, you know, just like the little people because these little people wound up doing all the things, you know, that, that the kid would do. I have this little house that opens it like, you know, would they climb on the roof? Is that really safe? We would exaggerate a little bit. Um, but, you know, I would sometimes make the little person get really, really mad. And like, what do, what can we do to help them calm down? And the, sometimes the kid would say, oh, you know, they need to, they need to go inside for a while. They can come out later when they're calmer. Um, and that was a child who had a lot of behavior problems um, that were very difficult to address directly um, because he felt very humiliated. If you would say, oh, what about when you got in trouble, you know, you hit somebody at school or you hit your brother and, um, and you were really angry and it was hard for you to stop. He was able to explain everything in terms of the little people and not with, that was quite a verbal child. Some children can't do it that much in words, but they can do it in their actions. Um, you know, giving their little figures a break or going and getting them a friend. That, that's a thing I will ask them to do a lot is, you know, can you find a friend? Um, either for this thing that you have made or like where's um, who who here would like to be in this place with you? Um, why don't you pick someone or or now that we're doing virtual therapy, they'll maybe pick a stuffed animal at their house. So, you know, we can really give those those little supports to move the story along. 
Yes. I'm, I'm sure what is also uh, is wonderful with these ideas that you said is that uh, with, without uh, uh, having, having said that, that we are actually trying to increase the repertoire of our children the, if they have if the if the mother or the parent feels that the child is playing appropriately but the kind of repertoire is quite narrow maybe that makes us feel that the child should have done much more than what she's doing at the moment i'm sure with your ideas like you said to build up something it it's about building up the whole story or the context or the characters it would also help us in our uh, some of the some of the core difficulties that we have about being limited, having limited interest, about being limited, being interested only in the doll, probably, if yes. if that is what, what what we mean, yeah. So there's there's another another question from uh, Shatabdi Bhattacharya, uh, who is asking about her son, three and a half years old, and who is on on therapies, that he is uh, probably spending a lot of time throughout the day in pretend play um, and uh, the uh, what what happens then is that the mother feels that probably because of he being engaged in his pretend play or his imaginary play he is pretty less uh, interested towards things like drawing or writing or social communication maybe because maybe the whole uh, mental energy is towards pretending or is towards make believe play so how 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 are we going to help him if we were to you know make again make his areas of interest a little more broader than pretend play to actually doing something with another person yes that's such a great question i'm thinking about <clears throat> a day that oh excuse me sure sure please go ahead um, <laughs> some parents came in um to talk to me about their child and to look at the space because I always want parents to meet me, of course, before I see their children and to see the space and get an idea of if their child would be comfortable. Um, and I usually encourage them to think of one thing you think your child would like and tell them about it before they come. Um, so we, you know, we have these little prompts to get them curious. Um, but these parents came in and they looked at the shelf behind me that had all the wild animals. And I have, I don't think you saw them. I didn't go down that far. Um, that shelf is very child height. But um, I have lots of lions, um, you know, a mother lion carrying a baby in her mouth and a father lion roaring and some little baby lions rolling around on the ground. And the parents um, who are super observant, looked around the whole room and they said, oh, this is what our child is going to love. He is just going to love this. Well, so the next week the child came in and guess what they did. You saw how many things are in this room. This little boy came in and he was so observant. Um, he's looking around, looking around and walking past the shelf and all of a sudden he goes, oh. And um, he did exactly what his parents predicted. Um, and he started taking out all of these lions. Um, and he was willing to bring, you have to walk across the room to go put things in the sand where I put um, Tigger and Eeyore earlier. But he brought them over and he put them in and he said almost nothing at all. Um, that he was very, very happy with what he did. And I asked him if the lions needed anything else and he got some trees, some rocks. Um, but then, you know, this really started to expand. And, you know, I was able to ask him some things about the lions and he wouldn't reject me. You know, he would let me say something and he would think about it. Um, and he started to tell more of a story in his play. So I think what I was doing is really, you know, consciously trying to support the play and to say, I, you know, I think we can, I would never say this to the child. <laughs> I think you can do more with this. Um, 
but you could say things like, oh, I'm curious about where the lion will go next, or you could even make it a much shorter sentence. Um, but he started to make homes for the lions and caves for the lions and all kinds of things. And then other characters started to come. So, you know, I didn't push him to go away from this. I didn't say, oh, you know, we've been doing lions for a month now. Let's play with something else. Um, because I honestly have been doing this work long enough that I have seen so much change happen through going into that perhaps narrow and very focused interest and gently um, expanding it. I've seen kids do this with basketball. I know nothing about basketball, by the way. I learned a lot. Um, where we were mutually telling stories, drawing, playing with basketball, lions, um, Godzilla. It almost doesn't matter what it is because the child cares about it. And one way you show them that you care about them is you get interested in what they're doing. Okay, great. So uh, there's another question from a parent, Kushi Zaman, and her son is six now, uh, and uh, he can understand a lot of things, he, but he cannot really talk a lot of uh, or, or express meaningful words. He can probably identify alphabet. He's, he's, he, uh, he's, uh, what I understand is he's much better in his academic abilities. However, despite giving him occupational therapy, speech therapy, there's very little improvement with producing meaningful words. And, um, and maybe produces only few specific odd sounds. Can there be something through uh, art and play therapy that can be done to produce a lot of, uh, to produce or increase meaningful word production uh, and overcome? Probably what, what I mean here is, what, what the parent means here is a lot of language development. Can, can it be fostered through our art and play? Oh, that's such an interesting question. So what I do with, with children um, who have a lot of communication challenges is um, obviously I consult with their parents a lot. I usually talk to the other therapists so that we're trying to work in coordination. Um, but a wonderful thing that does happen in art and in play therapy is that children do have the opportunity to tell a story in a variety of ways. They can do it through music, because um, remember the instruments that I have have very different qualities. You can do something calming, soothing, scary. Um, you can tell a, a whole story. Um, you can tell a story in the sand. And certainly I see children who are quite nonverbal um, and who tell stories first in another way. Um, I have seen kids start to talk so much more through playing in the sand, um, but those kids were also receiving a lot of other supports and a lot of speech. Um, the little boy I talked about before started making different voices for the lions. Um, and that might have been concerning, you know, in some settings because he was, um, you know, getting very absorbed in these different voices. But then um, he started to use them in communication. His mother couldn't believe it. She could kind of hear him through the door a little bit. She said, is he making up voices? Is he making up characters? And he and he was. So all of these things, like we were talking about before, Manish, um, intention, the child's intention is really, really important. And we want children to know that they have an intention, that they have an idea, because that's what we're doing. Part of what we're doing is supporting their wonderful ideas. Because when children are getting a lot of services, a lot of needed services, there's a great deal of clarity about what the child needs and you know the next step. And it's so important to remind all children, guess what? You also are having ideas. We're really 
interested in your ideas. Look, we have all these ways to help you show us your ideas and your stories. Sure. And there's another question about behavior problems, about children who might be impulsive or who may, may not have a very good uh, regulation of their activity levels, probably, or maybe their regulation of their emotions. So uh, the question, again, is can the, can the our modalities that we are talking about today, can they also help us in, and in what way can they help us with the behavior, uh, activity level kind of regulation or emotional regulation? Yeah, exactly, because the materials also are controlled or uncontrolled. And it's like a nice kind of metaphor, like this clay, oops, is, is very easy to control. But I also have what I call real clay, you know, real clay that comes from the earth needs a lot more hand skill. You have to work a lot harder. Um, and sometimes I'll make some balls of clay and the kid can throw it on the table and it goes wham. <laughs> And that's incredibly satisfying. First of all, they're usually amazed that I would let them do that because um, it's a little bit messy and it's loud and it's aggressive. But what we're trying to do is to appropriately channel those feelings of I'm out of control or I'm feeling a little overwhelmed or maybe I'm kind of mad. They might not be mad. They might just be overwhelmed. We can channel a lot of that through materials, you know, and we have to be very, so this is, you know, a very long explanation, but I'm going to try and um, um, cut it down a little bit. Um, we have to help channel things and help the child express. We also don't want to match their level too much um, that so, for example, if a child is really, really angry and really out of control, um, I probably would not let them throw balls of clay on the table. But if they were, you know, saying they were angry or had been acting angry, I would do that as a way to channel it. You don't want to match it too much. You don't want them to get completely out of control. That's very scary to the child and it's not helping them. Um, so having, I didn't show you my art closet, it's big, children can choose, but certain things I have on higher shelves because I want to choose them and I want to make sure that it's safe. Um, so we support them, we encourage them to go beyond, we don't exactly match them because that is when you've got, you know, throwing paint and, you know, and if people throw paint, a little boy once threw paint in a beautiful newly painted conference room when I was consulting at his school. It was red paint, by the way. Um, and I just took a deep breath and I said, now we're gonna clean it up together. <laughs> and we went and we got water and we got sponges and we washed. And the more we were washing, the, like, the calmer he got. Um, but yeah, that's such a good question. We have to think about the qualities of all these materials and, and what, um, what they bring out. And I have lots of choices. I don't just have one kind of clay. I don't have one kind of paint. I don't have one kind of drawing material. I have things that sort of, you know, contain your energy a little bit and things that let it go boom. And sometimes I pick because I think a child needs something in particular. Sure. The, the last question was from uh, a speech therapist to Pasna. And uh... I I'm sh I completely agree with you, uh, Jane. I'm so happy that you talked about how how we could how we should uh, look for something that matches to their. Uh, so like we do, what we do with children with ADHD when they come to us and they are pretty impulsive and they the only thing that they that they feel kind of reinforced is is when they are into an activity that is about uh, knocking down something probably something that is that is a little aggressive or destructive but uh, like you said in play you could have something that uh, on on one side uh, sounds a little destructive but if you see a bowling game that you do 
you yeah. knock down the you knock down the bowling pins i mean it's a it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a beauty of our, of 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 our games and sports or play that there are all kinds of emotional regulations that are possible so if i choose something so in my occupational therapy we use a lot of bowling pins uh, uh may, maybe not the same way as you do in a in a bowling alley but we still use them or maybe you know in from the india india bangladesh kind of context the cricket is such an important game and you know in cricket you have three three wickets that that tend to be knocked down uh so if i have a child who has who is looking for some kind of a, that kind of an activity what i do typically is that there would be the only act, it, the only part of the game that you are going to do is not that somebody else will be playing in front of you it would just be the knocking down part just knock down something you know yeah. knock down something and and actually get reinforced for it you know knock down wow you had a wonderful throw you had such a good directionality in your in your activity that you could, you were you were actually knocked down so which means later on when you play with other ch- other children you might be a very good uh, a fielder of the ball who would actually target on the, on those wickets so that's how we kind of channelize and make it a little more uh meaningful that in the 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 impulsivity can also be uh meaningful and we can actually channelize it like you said so uh, i'm i'm so happy that that your your the play and art and the way occupational therapy is are so aligned together with, with each other um there's another another question from uh, a, a parent and uh, this question is is about taking interest in academics so harmeet kaur has asked can there be a way to create interest in studies for my four and a half year old son and uh, he, she says that he seems to have lost complete interest in the academic in the studies so can the art and play modality and of course it's it's a it's a very very diff- uh, i i i assume that it's a very uh different end of the spectrum on on art and you know on art and play and academic i i find them very different on the very different two ends of the spectrum however if you have well, any ideas well i i just had this conversation yesterday with a little girl and her mother she's older by the way and it was a challenge for her so i think we have to remember what we're asking children to do right now in the midst of the pandemic is really hard so in bangladesh and in india you don't have snow days um here in new england we have snow days when we have a snowstorm we get sometimes where i live you know 16 inches of snow and everything closes and there's no school and you stay home and maybe you wear your pajamas and you bake cookies and it's really fun So what I've been saying to parents during the pandemic who are having a hard time I've said this is not a snow day. You know, we don't know when it's ending. It's scary. It's not fun, at least not most of the time. You know, there's a lot of free floating anxiety for everyone, you know, including parents who are trying to support their children. So what we're asking children to do right now in terms of focus and to do their school their lessons online we are asking so much of them and this is exactly exactly what this mother was saying because this is a, a child who's who's very creative and very bright child um but lots of trouble with attention um and the mother was saying oh she just it's just so hard for her to sit and do this so what i did is a little bit like what i did with you you know i said oh look so i have this squishy cushion that i sit on um and i have all these all these nice things on my on my table you know that sound good i have some essential oils here i have things that smell good I have all my fidgets. I have all these things that feel good and the kid was like, "Oh, yes, I remember those things from your office." And I said, "You know what? I have all these things for me and I'm grown up. And when I don't want to sit in this chair, I go sit in my rocking chair, you know, and I put a toy on the chair and I rocked it. And I said, "You you maybe you need to be thinking about how you sequence this time." 
and having lots of supports are really good because it's terribly difficult right now for children to sit. And I have been, here we just finished school, I have been congratulating all my kids and telling them what a great job they did because that's true for everybody who got through their spring of school. I mean, I do have children who did much better at home without the distractions at school, without behavior of other children. Um, I, you know, I have kids whose performance was astonishing. And I've said, now the school has to figure out how to keep supporting this now that they know everything they can do. Um, but it's very, very hard. And I think that we need to think about how we sequence children's time, you know, and supports and breaks, and also what are our expectations. Um, I think, you know, for children to be reasonably happy and getting along well in their family and maybe being willing to try a couple of new things, I think that's a huge accomplishment. Sure, yeah. So I think we, we might have a, we might have to take one more question because we already uh, gone about our time of an hour. So Sumitra Paul Bakshi, a parent from Kolkata, is asking about her son who is 10 years old on the spectrum. And uh, she, her question is, which shades of colors can be used more preferably during art activities if we were to give him a sense of calming, a sense of soothing? Oh, I love that question. And hi, Sumitra. Um, I often say that we don't think about color as much as we might in art therapy. Um, I have to go get one more thing. I'll be right back. So this is, remember I said I had baskets. This is my basket of silk scarves. So if I were going to choose a common color, happens to be on the top, one of my favorite colors. Um, these are silk, they're very light. Um, lots of times children like to take the scarves out and they maybe they'll create an environment in the room for the puppets or the animals or themselves. Um, I have some big ones. This is, this is the best one. This is a rainbow. Um, children can wrap it around them. Um, you know, I have found this kind of color that can envelop you, children love. Um, they want to choose because they might have their own idea of what feels calming and what feels relaxing and what feels exciting. Sometimes they use these like to make a volcano, they make lava and then we get away from the lava. Um, but I've, you know, really, really liked using um, textiles that way and you have such beautiful silks where you are i bet you could find some things like this um and then there are um sometimes using watercolors which can really cover the whole paper and they're going to look beautiful whether you're making something realistic or not um but i you know, and, and try doing different colors. But I think the important thing is to find out, um, you know, what your, what your son connects with it. Like I might say, okay, this is my common color. And somebody else might say, you know, I would, I would not pick this. Um, but children sometimes say, oh, this is the one that I like. And kind of yeah. like yeah. you were talking about before, those big gestures, sometimes we we have to really go big, like big sheets of paper, big pieces of material, um, you know, so that kids really get that feeling of, you know, oh, here's one to cheer you up, or at least this cheers me up. Um, you know, it might overstimulate some people, but sometimes you want to just be enveloped um, and kids do have permission. I've only got one child here at a time, unless maybe I've got a sibling. Um, they have been known to like cover the whole room with these silks and put in the animals and 
make an environment. I've had children um, take, oops, it fell on the floor. They'll take this, they'll put it on top of a chair. They'll say, here's a cloud, they'll put a bird on it. Um, so there's, there's something about, um, you know, moving into the environment a little bit like that, that also is calming. And then what you do, or what I do, is, you know, we say, oh, what was really nice about that? Or maybe you want to now pick like a little stone that's that same color and you can put it in the little teeny pocket in your backpack and it can remind you. Um, so there's the thinking part is, you know, maybe we take something like this and it's big and you can't carry it around with you, but what is the little thing that you can carry around with you? And, and sometimes children will make things like this kind of clay you bake in in the oven and it's hard and it's not going to break they can make a little thing or they can draw a little picture on a little rock um, i have these white rocks i get at the beach they can draw a picture or paint a picture and they can take it with them and it's like you know a transitional object you know something that connects what they did here and that makes them feel calm and if they can do part of it themselves, that's wonderful because then they have more a sense of agency. And it's like, oh, that was my good idea. So just one last uh, question, or you could just have a comment on it. Do you, do you think during this pandemic, we can do something online with children using art and play? Because, you know, with these uh, limited like like in, in India, I'm, I I uh, I'm, I'm I have a little idea about Bangladesh as well. That maybe the children are still not allowed to really move out and meet with other children or attend a therapy place or a therapy center. Really, so do have you did have you kind of had a, some kind of a feel of using these same things that you were talking about on an online medium with children across sitting across the screen? And how does it how does it work if it is an online session of three, maybe three children together on a Zoom meeting, probably. Will it, will it, will it still work? Um, I know people who are doing that for art classes, and um, I hear that it's going really well. I have been only doing one-on-one, -on -one, and that transition to being virtual has gone really well. Like, for example, um, we've been doing something where the child holds up a, a very thin piece of paper to the screen and they like trace around it and then they have a drawing of me. Um, and I do that and I have a drawing of them. And then we, you know, change it into a character like a baseball player. One kid turned me into a zombie. <laughs> I wish I had. Um, that picture and this and we talked about how you know that's kind of right now it kind of feels sometimes like a zombie apocalypse and that's scary um, so we can do very you know expressive and connected things and I think it absolutely would work you know if there was a focus for the meeting like and everybody had um, the same materials doesn't matter how simple they are um that kids really like being able to um share and and have people react to what they're doing and we've done sand trays like that too where um the children tell me what what to put in to make the story they tell me or they point or um i have one child who whose mother got a, a tray to use at home so he does things and i and i do things um, and there's lots of ways really to experiment with that. I think it could work really well with it, particularly a small group and parents would need to support. And that's hard because parents are needing to support everything right now. You know, all the services, all the learning, and then people are still sometimes working and then um, you're still needing to run your home. So it's a lot, but I, I, I have seen that as children get used to this modality, they're much more um, independent. You know, I have kids who call me up for their therapy session. You know, it's, for example, 4.30 Monday afternoon, um, you know, my iPad is dinging 
Um, and it's a kid and he's all set up and he's sitting at his table and he has everything that he wants to show me. This is an older kid, but it absolutely can work because it's what we have. And we really, you know, need to use our creativity. That's one thing I think we can take from art and play is use that sort of creative spirit and see where, where we can go because we need to. Sure. And uh, for our viewers at the moment, we would like to uh, share with them that on 3rd July, we have Stephen Shaw and he's talking about making autism a gift rather than weakness or disability. I think that that concept uh, which comes from the ability model of autism that Stephen is so passionate about. And we would it would be great to have all stakeholders, uh, therapists, therapists, parents, uh, professionals to be to be in that program uh, same time on 3rd July with Stephen Shore, one of the key persons in the field of autism throughout the world. And we would be very happy to have your questions on that day as well about how autism can be completely transformed into an ability, uh, into a strength, into a gift rather than a disability. So that would be that would be pretty interesting. I'm myself looking forward to it. And uh, Jane, I'm I, I'm sure we have taken 15 to 17 minutes over over uh, what we had decided. But thank you so much, and uh, uh, um, thank you uh, from Madam Nilofar Karimapa, who is the key oh. person behind Faith Faith Bangladesh. She has sent in her message as well, and she's she's she's, she's live live and watching the program. So on behalf of uh, of her uh, at on all the team at at Faith Bangladesh, and on behalf of here, everybody here in Gurgaon at, at Soch, uh, I would like to thank you one more time for a wonderful insight on, uh, that today we shared and, and so much of a lovely discussion that we had. I'm sure a lot of parents would look forward and we are going to do this as a series with, with uh, different people like I shared in the beginning and I look forward to having you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. I feel like we just had a wonderful visit.